I went to drama school when I was about 20 years old, I think, with the intention of being an actor. Purely, that's all I ever wanted to do, really. Um, but I always thought I'd be a theatre actor for the rest of my life. And so when I left drama school in the end of the <coughs> 80s, um, I expected to, or hoped, dearly hoped, to get a contract at the Fortune Theatre in Dunedin. And thought that if I could work there as a as an actor for long forever, I'd be happy. Um, and that, that was that was as far as far ahead as I could think. You know, um, I've, to this day, I've never had a contract at the Fortune Theatre. I'm trying to get my mother, who's turning into a zombie, to look presentable or something. And I, what do I do? I I end up slicing her cheek off or something, and this flat falls down, and then I, I get the glue out and I glue it back on. And it's a funny, nothing little moment in compared to lawnmowers and all that other stuff, but I, I, when I, on the rare times that I've seen the film in recent years, which is a long time now, but I, always, I really like that moment. And the lawnmower sequence was, the, actually, it was hell. Um, we filmed that, a, it was a, that was a long day, and it was just over and over and over. And I, there's a, a moment at the end where, um, when, when Lionel's kind of done everything, he just he just screams out in this absolute sort of help, and um, that, that was me. That was me going. I don't know how many more times I can I can carry this lawnmower around and spray out all this blood. It was one of those films. I think we looked back on in hindsight and went, it actually was a film that didn't quite know its audience, and I. I've, I, I I've, um, I think it was a film that wasn't aimed enough at a younger audience and it wasn't sophisticated enough for an older audience so it fell between two stools and it's a, it's a, and when you're dealing in a feature film that's, it's fatal. I loved doing that film. Um, it was a fun, really fun character, I mean it was all pretty much about the facial hair. Um, and yeah, I mean that's that's one of those indelible uh, Kiwi film moments. I think the taking it from behind on the couch. It's, it's I think it's almost the opening shot, isn't it, or something? Yeah, the cinema going culture has has changed a lot, and those films like Jack Brown and, and Via Satellite. I mean, Via Satellite now, if you if you were to make that today, you'd pretty much go. Actually, that's a telly feature. We make that a that's a great film for TV um, because it's increasingly hard to get people to go to the cinema, uh, especially on a local level, and they really need to be event films. A film like Vice Satellite had a great uh, it had a it had a much better life on television. Right up until it went to air, I don't think anyone hand on their heart would say they knew it was going to be the success it was. The, the reason it was a success, it's, it's a, it's, and it's, I think that generally speaking, it's a, it's a happy accident of, of timing that the New Zealand public were ready to receive uh, an entertaining drama about that type of family in our, in our nation, a recognisable family that weren't pretentious. There's nothing Jafferish about um, about West Auckland. I think that's one of the keys. It's the fact that West Auckland resonates with the rest of New Zealand because it's. I come from Tauranga. It, it, West Auckland could be Tauranga in the in the 80s. It's a type of New Zealand that people, broadly speaking, trust. Plus the fact that TV3 backed it to the hilt when it came out, and they went, you know what, we love it, and you're going to love it too. And I watched it as a objective observer out there in TV land, when I watched episode one of Outrageous Fortune, I, I sat there in front of the TV, um, I was on my own, uh, was that and I went, wow, we've arrived, because I went writing, directing, performances, everything about that show arrived at the same level at the same time, and off, up until that point I think we've often managed to get it almost right. Everything's been quite good, except that wasn't quite as good as it should have been. And Outrageous presented a completely consistent 
television hour. I think that should remain a secret, the storylining table secret. But let's just say that I was a great advocate of it, and I I remember the day that we we did storyline that quite vividly. And it's funny, it's to me it seemed like a really, really natural thing to happen. I and it wasn't until it's gone to air that I quite realised how uh, how vehement people have been about that, how morally outraged they've been, which, as I, I remember saying at the time, you know, we all, you know, we used to have this little mantra at the storylining table, which was, don't forget, it's called Outrageous Fortune, you know, and the show works its best when we keep reminding ourselves of that. And of course, as the series went on, it's a fine line between being outrageous for the sake of it and um, and not you know jumping the shark, so to speak. And Kirk Torrance and, and, and Siobhan Russell just did a fantastic job of selling that. I mean, that is a difficult thing to pull off with, and they just did it with such decorum and um, and truthfulness. It's just, I think it's beautiful to watch. It was fun because I'd been writing for the show for so long uh, and to actually go out on set for a few days to do a cameo um, was it was a really good reminder of how fast the, you know, shows like Outrageous and Go Girls and the Whitey Johnsons are made at high velocity um, because that's our, it's a, it's a template that South Pacific Pictures can make work, give you high production values. At, at a at a fast fast pace, and they they shoot very quickly, and it was a really good thing to be reminded of as a writer. Um, when you write this and this and this, these are the realities that are going to be uh, confronted out there at the coalface. Uh, that was a, a story that had been in development here for quite some time, and at SPP, and um, it was Katarina Denave at TV3 approached John Barnett and said. You know, this would be an amazing television movie, and so they did quite a bit of work on it here, a lot of research. And uh, James Griffin actually wrote an orig the original treatment for it, but it was deemed to be too too close to the uh, it was the wrong time, so it kind of got parked. And then the new commissioner at TV3, Rachel Jean, pulled it out and said to SVP, "This has got to be made. Must be made now." It's too good. Um, and so when, when network executives do that, you go, OK. There's one thing I've learned over recent years working in the, in the business and particularly in this job here, is when it comes to television, New Zealand television, uh, locally, our audiences, they're still not particularly interested in seeing ourselves take ourselves too seriously. So. The beauty of Outrageous was it was most of the time bloody funny, but it was always anchored in an emotional and dramatic heart. As it turned out, I, I ended up being in the Almighty Johnsons. Uh, it's about four brothers, four recognisable Kiwi brothers, um, who just happened to be descended from Norse gods, which is our kind of point of difference. Uh, but it's essentially a battle of the sexes story, and um, you know, seen through the eyes of, of these four brothers and and the, and the, the God thing, and, and uh, it by chance it ended up that I've, I've ended up playing the oldest brother, um, which was uh, kind of a happy accident in the end. Um, so yeah, no, I'll be I'll be turning up on on the TV three uh, screens next year with that.